sometimes I'll count the songs in my head, and I'm like, ah, oh, I can't, I lost track between two and three, you know? I'm like, that's how bad I have a counter. Right? That's why we have a finance team here at the church. They help me. <laughs> two and three, you get confused? I don't know. Seemed like it was a long song. Maybe it's two, maybe it's three. Could be neither one. Hey, glad you're here. Uh, it's fun to be back together again to worship, uh, to be able to be in a building, uh, you know, not out of the park. It's still a little cold. Little, it's getting warmer, but it's definitely not a good park day. But hey, we're glad to be here. We're thankful uh, to have a place where we can still gather in this season. Uh, so hey, we're jumping right in today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. We started off last week, we're talking about run and what it looks like to learn how to run as a church, how to get stronger, how to get healthier, how to get disciplined, how to run in unity, in sync. Uh, have you ever seen like a you know, three-legged race and, uh, and you can just tell like, okay, there's, you know, a 6'8 guy and a 5'10 girl and it's just like, you know, they're not, they're having a hard time running in sync in a three-legged race. Uh, that for the church, there's all different types of sizes, all different types of strength, all different, different types of speed, where you are in your faith, where you are in your walk. And so for a church, it's important to learn how do we run in unity? How do we run together as we're running this race that God has called us to? So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul. Chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Sosthenes. Chosen to be an apostle. Uh, who do you guys think is, well, I, you know, I mean, this is an easy one. I was going to ask who's the greatest coach of all time? Tom Osborne, obviously. Okay, outside of Tom Osborne. Let, let me hear you. What's your what's your opinion to who the greatest coach of all time? Bobby Bowden. Bobby Bowden. All right. I know Bobby Bowden. Yeah, that's you, right? Yeah. Our Florida State people. Uh, Bobby Bowden. Any sport? Who else you got? John Cook. John Cook. Ooh, okay, okay. Coach I heard another one. What was another one? Coach K. Coach K. All right. I had that one on my list. Oh, yeah. Bill Jackson. Bill Jackson. Yeah. Bill Belichick. I got my Bill Belichick up there. Some people are like, oh, Tom Brady made it. Well, you know, you can say Bill Belichick made Tom Brady. I don't know. Vice versa there. Uh, yeah, he's vice versa, right? I don't know. <laughs> coaches and players, when we look at those two things together, like you can have a great coach, but if you don't have great players, it's hard to win a championship. You can have a great player, but if you don't have a great coach, they're not going to win a championship. We've all seen teams like that. You need each other. They have to be in sync with each other. They have to work together. Great coaches, great teams, great players, all of it coming together as one. Uh, you can have one of the best coaches in the world. You can have great strategy and all that. But if you don't have the talent to go along with that, man, you're going to go out there and it's going to be tough to compete in whatever sport you're going out into. And you can be the most talented player on the court, but if you can't get along with your coach, I mean, we've seen that, you know, NBA, NFL, there's great players that have never won a championship, and you see them, you know, they're some of those guys that have fought the most or argued the most or disagreed the most with their coaches, and there's nothing in sync about their relationship. The church in Corinth is out of sync. That's why Paul is writing them. He's writing them because there's problems and there's issues. In fact, if you jump down here, it, sorry, I'm going to have you jumping all over for verses today, but if you jump down here, uh, verse, let me see it here, uh, go to like verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Verse 11, for some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. All right, Chloe's household, they snitched on everybody, all right? They were visiting, they were checking out Corinth for a little bit, and they saw what was going on. And they went back and they saw Paul and they told Paul, they filled him in, they said, 
Yo, Paul, that church you started in Corinth a few years ago, that it started strong, things were going well, but right now there are quarrels, there are fights, there's divisions breaking out. You know, some people back in Corinth are probably like, Chloe? Dang it, Chloe? Why are you ratting on us? Okay, that, that's what this matter is about. There's divisions, there's disunity, they're, they're out of sync as a church. And so I, I think for us, you know, in this beginning stage, we're, you know, technically, I mean, you could say we're a year old right now. I just saw on Time Hop the other day, our, our first worship night when we gathered was uh, February 15th, just a little over a year ago now. And so we're about a year old as a church. And, and so, you know, we haven't seen a lot of big fights or divisions, you know. When you're young, when you're first getting started, and things are great, everything's awesome, everything's easy. But the more you go along, the further along you get together as a group of people, the more problems or issues or fights have a chance to come up. And so that's what's happening here in Corinth. That's why Paul has written this letter. Because the divisions and the disunity is taking place. And so he starts right here in chapter 1, verse 1, with establishing leadership. There has to be leadership structure for the church to be healthy. There has to. And so Paul establishes right off the bat, I, I was called by God to be an apostle. An apostle, that word, uh, apostello. And uh, it, it was used to express divine authorization to accomplish a well-divine and specific task. Okay, it, it was used to identify uh, somebody acting on God's authority, sent by God by his authority. That's what Paul is establishing right here. Okay, that he was called to be an apostle. And so because of that, there is structure, there is leadership. He, he's, the, he's the head coach. That's what Paul is. And he's establishing, hey, God called me into this position of authority over you as a church. And now I can kind of see, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I took the training wheels off and I said, here you go, ride on your own for a little bit. And, you know, you're riding inside the house, you're making a mess, you're riding all over people's lawns. Like, I, I got to rein you back in. That's what Paul's doing here. He's the head coach. He's reining them back in. And, and a little bit of it is it, it's pride, right? Like, Paul's been away for a little bit, and there's been some good things happening, and, and he starts getting a little full of yourself. He starts to think, we've got it figured out. We're good. We don't even need Paul anymore. We are rocking and rolling. We've got all these spiritual gifts. You're going to see that theme come up a lot in the book of 1 Corinthians. There are spiritual gifts the Holy Spirit gives us. And we're to use them for the building up of the kingdom. And so these people, they're feeling pretty good about who they are and their pride is growing. And so Paul, he, he has to rein them back in. And, and I will tell you this, no matter how good you are, you can be the best, uh, you know, let's go back to sports for a minute. In fact, I'm going to go back to Tom Brady. Because I, I read this article a few years ago, and, and I love this line that he said when he was talking about when he was with the Patriots, and uh, I think Bill O'Brien uh, was one of his coaches there. And Bill O'Brien says one time when Tom came up to him, and he said, Listen, I, I want you to coach me. Like, that would be intimidating, right? For a coach to come in, kind of brand new to the system, and you have one of the greatest quarterbacks in the game to ever play, a future Hall of Famer, Super Bowl winner, and you're kind of thinking, he definitely knows a lot more about quarterbacking than I know. <laughs> like, he, he has played it better, he knows it better, he's been around it forever. How do I coach this guy? But that was what Tom came and said to him. He said, I want to be coached. He understood authority. He understood leadership structure. And he understood that he needed someone to push him to be better. He needed someone to hold him accountable to be better. He didn't want to just stay where he was. He wanted to keep moving forward. If you want to run, you need someone in your life that's going to push you. You need someone that's going to hold you accountable. You need to submit to authority in your life. That's a hard thing. I hate that. I hate it. I've been in a lot of places. I've been in a lot of churches in my life. And 
uh, submitting to authority is one of the hardest things in our life. Especially here in America, because a lot of times we step into a church or step into a place, and, and, and we think the church should look like a democracy. We do. We think that. We think, mm, you know what? Like, I didn't vote for this lead pastor. I didn't vote for that worship pastor. Not my pastor. Not my president. Not my pastor. All right? We do that. We do that in the church. No, no, no. Paul wasn't voted for. He was called. There's amen. Thank you, man. There we go. Front row. Amen. Paul wasn't voted for. He was called. Amen. There we go. Okay? That's a hard thing for us. We struggle with that in America. I did. I, I remember growing up in a church and my family. I grew up in a family that had a hard time submitting to authority. I love my family. I, I, I care about them a lot. But man, there, there's a difference in your life when you learn what it looks like to truly submit to authority. But man, if you run from submission to authority, you're going to be on the run your whole life. You're going to be going from church to church, from, you know, bouncing around from here to there. You're never going to be happy. There is blessing when you live under the umbrella of authority. In, in ministry, I learned how to live under the umbrella of authority for a long time. I, I was a youth pastor for a long time. Youth pastors, they last on average about one and a half years. Okay? I, I did youth ministry, for, I think, for 11 or 12. Um, I, it was because God taught me through those years what it looks like to submit to leadership, even when you don't agree with leadership. Even when you look at the direction leadership is taking something and, and you say, no, like, I, I don't like that. I think we should go over here. I think we should try this. And if you are colliding and you're trying to pull apart what God has ordained, what he has put in place, you're not going to be living under that umbrella of blessing in your life. When you learn how to submit to leadership, even when you don't agree with that leadership, there's an umbrella and a hedge of protection and blessing underneath that. I know, because I, there were moments I looked at it in my life and I thought, I don't like this, I don't like this, but God's called me here, he's placed me here at this time in this place. I know he's not opening any other doors in my life. This is where I'm supposed to be. What other option do I have? But to submit to the one that God has placed in leadership over my life. That's a hard thing. It's a difficult thing. But I, I will tell you, you can look back on your life, no matter how many times you disagree with what leadership is doing above you, man, you can look back someday and say, I don't have any regrets about submitting in that season, even when it was difficult, even when I didn't agree with some of the decisions I've made, because there was protection and blessing underneath that umbrella. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. <laughs> <laughs> you, you read the head? All right. We're still on chapter 1. Shoot, we're on verse 1. Come on. <laughs> You're going to be in Corinthians all year. I am writing once again, he's establishing structure here. Verse 2, I am writing to God's church in Corinth. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth. Whose are we? We're God's first. We are God's first. Then Jesus. And then we have an umbrella of leadership structure. That God, he calls people into those places and he puts them there for a reason. I have a hard time with this. And, I, and Paul does too. I have a hard time believing sometimes, God, why did you call me? I'm not qualified. <laughs> I'm not. But most of you guys you know that. Like I was a youth pastor. What do you know about doing this? What do you know about leading the church? Nothing. I'm learning as I go. All right? That's the truth. But when Paul says he was called, I, I know that's true in my life. Because I, I looked for so many other avenues to try and walk down. So many other paths that I wanted to take in my life. But every time I looked, every time I peeked, it was like, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. He made it so clear to me. And he said, this is what I'm calling you to. You've been called. 
Stop denying your calling. There's people in here right now that have been denying their calling. God's been putting something on your heart in this season, in these last couple of weeks. God's been putting something on your heart, and you're saying, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to give that up. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to do that thing that you're calling me to do, God. I, that's not me. That's not my life. Stop denying your calling. Pick up that phone when he calls, because it's worth it. It's hard. It's difficult. It's a little scary walking into the dark when you can't see the path ahead of you more than one or two steps at a time. But he's making a way. Stop denying your calling. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth. To you who have been called by God. You all. It's not just the pastors. We haven't just been called. You all. All of us. The church. You who have been called by God. To be his own holy people. You're not here by accident today. You're not a part of revival by accident today. There has been things in your life that have made it abundantly clear. You have been called to this time and this place for a reason. Embrace that calling in your life. Don't forget, we're a holler back church. Amen. Yeah, here we go. Amen. You can holler back at me. You can help me preach. That we're the church. We do this together. There we go. Here we go. Now that you belong to Christ Jesus, through Him, God has enriched your church in every way. With all your eloquent words and all your knowledge, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into partnership. Into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He, he didn't invite you in to, um, to sit. He didn't invite you in to hang out. He didn't invite you in to watch. He didn't invite you in to just kind of sit back and, and watch others. He's invited you into partnership. Into the kingdom. Into the calling of the kingdom. Go and make disciples. What are you doing right now to walk in step with that call of partnership? with Jesus. Sometimes we sit back and we think, you know what? I, I can see there's a problem. I can see there's an issue. I can see there's something going on with her life or his life or their lives. Then I hope God does something for them. Man, I, I'm just going to pray. Like, I hope God works something out for them. And he's saying to you right now, no, 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 no. I called you into partnership with me. We're going to do this together. You see a problem? I'm going to use you to step in, and we're going to do this together. We're going to do ministry together. We're going to do kingdom work together. You've been called into partnership with Jesus. Stop sitting back and just saying, God's going to take care of that over there. God, God, will, God will solve that. God will take care of that. No, no, no. Walk in partnership with him. These first nine verses also, you need to catch this. Paul is establishing something. These first nine verses that we just read, Jesus is mentioned nine times. One time for every verse. Jesus, head over the church. We are the bride of Christ. This is his church. Now, to the divisions. Verse 10. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. To live in harmony with each other. Ask the Holy Spirit right now, is there somebody in your life within the body of the church that you're not living in harmony with? Does he bring a name to your mind? Does he bring someone to the front and you're like, yeah, I'm out of harmony there. Yeah. And it might not even be here in the church, but it might be at home. It might be in your family. It might be. There is somebody in your life right now where you know and you ask the Holy Spirit, am I living in harmony? No. <laughs> you need to fix this. 
We have to figure out how to live in harmony, not just with those in the church, but outside of the church. Let there be no division in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe, there's Chloe again. For some members of Chloe's household have snitched on you about the quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Here are some of the divisions that happen. These people in the church, they, they were kind of looking around and they were going to say, Paul's my guy, you know? And some of them, there's this other guy that had come through there, a guy named Apollos. He had come through a little bit after Paul had gotten that church started and established, and he was a great teacher. I mean, when he spoke, I mean, he, he just, he was very educated. You know, he could count from two to three. He was smart, all right? He was real bright. And so when this guy came in, some of them were like, Paul? Yeah, right, old school, man, I'm going to Apollos. And some of them, they heard about Peter, and they heard him preach, and they're like, Peter's my guy. And, and, and we still do this today sometimes. We still have these divisions within the church, not just here at Revival, but the church as a whole. There's some that say, man, I, I follow the Pope. Whatever the Pope says, I'm with that, all right? There, there's some that say, oh, I follow Stephen Furtick on Instagram. You know, that's who I'm getting my life advice from. That dude is great. He's killing it. I love Furtick. I, I don't blame him. He's awesome. All right? And you just kind of pick and choose some of these different preachers and you say, no, no, no. This is my authority. No, no, this is my authority. And that's what they had going on here. There were all these divisions just within the church. Just within the church. It's like people say, you know, I follow Andrew because he's got nice hair. And some people say, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, he does. He does, I know. You know, and some people say, oh, I, you know, Alex, you know, he's got really cool jeans. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Just making fun of my ripped up jeans, all right? Uh, and, and, you know, you can have that within the church body. And you can even have that within the city. You can jump around from church to church and say, man, I, I kind of like this pastor over here. I, I like what uh, this church is doing. I'm going to go over there for a little bit. But then after a little while, you know, it's like you, you hear about some, you know, new upcoming church. And you're like, go over there. I'm going to check out what that pastor's doing. And there's all these divisions that form. And people don't just stay planted in the church that God has called them to. There's power when you choose to be planted where God has called you. There's power and there's freedom and there's blessing when you live and choose to be a part of where he's called you to be planted. Paul, he wants to establish very clearly, we're all on the same team, okay? Some of you are saying I'm a follower of Paul, others are saying I follow Apollos. Verse 13, has Christ been divided into factions? Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? No. Were any of you baptized into the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For now no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. But I don't remember baptizing anyone else. I think that's funny. I think that's hilarious. That's like, sometimes staff will ask me, did you do this and, you know, take care of this? I'm like, I, maybe, I don't remember. I, I feel like that's Paul right here. I, I'm going to baptize a couple of them. I don't remember who. I don't know. You know. He's very honest, you know. I like that. He's not trying to, like, hmm, pretend to be something he's not. I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And not with clever speech for fear that the cross of Christ will lose its power. There's always going to be something newer, something bigger, something better. There's going to be something going on over here, something going on over here. But God has called you to be planted in a church. So wherever you are, let him plant you in that place. If you know, hey, he's called me here and he's planted me here, but if you're going to choose to be planted, you have to understand that we're not a bunch of, you know, 
we're not going to have these divisions. We're, we're not going to have these arguments. We're not going to have these fights. Uh, in essentials, we have unity. In the non-essentials, we have liberty. Okay? There are essentials that we will always agree on in Scripture. And is Jesus the Son of God? Do, do we believe in the virgin birth? Are those essentials to us? Yes, these are essentials. Do we believe that He is the way, the hope, and the truth? That no one comes to salvation except through Him? Yes, that's an essential. But then there's going to be some of these other things that come up in Scripture. And you might not agree or love that tag. And you might think, man, I don't, I don't know if I really you know, I'm there 100%. You're not going to find a church in this world, and there's a lot of them, that you're going to agree 100% with everything. But the essentials, we have to have agreement on. And the non-essentials, we're going to have liberty. And in all things, we'll have love. Paul gets to that later on in Corinthians too. He covers everything. Corinthians is amazing. If you haven't read it, Get it open, start reading it, start going through it as we're going through this series and learning how to run and how to be healthy as a church. Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your spiritual leaders. And do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Here's Paul again. This is the heart of Paul as an apostle. Like when you read through Corinthians, he hurts for the divisions of the church. He hurts for the fights that are going on. He cares about the people. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. I, I feel that. Like, like, this has not been an easy thing for me to step into. I, I, I don't know exactly how to step into this position of leadership and authority over a church, but I want you to know I, I care about people. I, I, I care about people. I, I love the people that we get to do church with. I love that we get to come together and then there are friendships and bonds being forged here that, that they're, they're strong. Some of them, you know this already, they're stronger than some of your own family members that you have in your life. Christ bonds us and unites us in a way like nothing else. So when we preach hard things here, when, when we bring up things or topics and you think, man, don't tell me how to handle my money. That's a hard one, right? Like, who's Alex to tell me how to handle my money? I'm just telling you what God told me to tell you. He wants it. Because he wants your heart. Amen. That is it. Yes. Money's one of the hardest ones, okay? I hate talking about that as a preacher. Because I just want you to want him. And I know that's one of the biggest barriers for us as believers. Don't tell me what to do with my money. It's mine. He just tells you to give up one tenth. And guess what? It's his anyway. He's letting you keep nine. Change your mindset. Change your mindset. He's the creator of all things. The gold, the silver, everything in this world, everything that is precious. He's the creator. It's his. So when I tell you that, don't get mad at me. Open up his word and say, oh, oh, let me find that. Oh, I'm going to argue that. Oh, shoot. All right, God. All right. Okay. Or sex. Shoot, we're going to talk about sex. Wait till chapter six. Oh my goodness. And some of you are going to be like, don't tell me this is my body. No, 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 no. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, Lord. Shoot. What is mine? Nothing. Nothing. But you have me. That's what he's saying to you right now. 
That's all you need.
because that's demonic and we don't want it in our church. Don't, don't let somebody come up to you and just be like, I just need to vent for a second. I've been around places that vent, all right? That ain't venting. It's toxic. We kill it at the door and we say, have you talked with them yet? If not, I don't want to hear it. That would kill division in the church. That question. Go ahead. If you're right, if you're taking notes for a note-taking church, write that down. Have you talked with them yet? Go and talk to that person. That will kill division before it even begins in this church. All right, let's pray. And then let's worship. God, thanks for this word. Thanks for your book. Thanks for Paul and the words he gives your church. And God, I just pray that we step forward as a church, that we take steps forward and we go running in to this life of faith that you've called us to, that we would start to run this race with the endurance and strength that you've called us to. God, that we would know and understand the structure that you've established, the leaders that you call and put in places, and the giftings that you've given people within the church to use to partner with your son Jesus in ministry. And I just ask that you would equip us going forward to continue the work and the calling that you've placed on our lives and our hearts here. You've called us here, God. God, let us be planted here in this place so our roots can grow, grow down deep, so that we can grow up to be strong and firm in your faith. We love you, Jesus. And we submit to you all that we are. Every part of our lives we submit over to you in this moment through worship. And in prayer.